lot of people are gonna remember Goodbye Volcano High. Even more, the fan-made parody that spawned from it, Snoot Game, which to everyone's surprise ended up being pretty freaking good. Not just as a parody, but a genuine visual novel. To that, now there's something of a spiritual successor, ditching the origins as a spoof to create something entirely original. Mac Cheese to host, and tonight we're reviewing I Wanna Hug That Gator. I Wanna Hug That Gator is a very typical visual novel. Character stills, dialogue, make a choice every now and then. Aside from a couple of arbitrary drawing segments, there's nothing much to note gameplay-wise. It takes place in Volcadera Bluffs, the very same in Snoot Game, the very same seemingly alternate Earth where humans and anthropomorphic dinosaurs coexist. It sees you following Inko G. Nito, a naive, awkward, isolated goofball of a human who just can't seem to read the room. Due to his distant parents' career paths, he finds himself moving from school to school school, never quite being able to settle down and make friends, which he hopes to change in his now senior year where he attends St. Hammond, a high school with an arts-oriented culture that is populated entirely by anthropomorphic dinosaurs. He perhaps gets more than he bargained for when he meets Olivia, a passionate and talented artist, wheelchair-bound Baryonox with a little bit of PUDGE. When first met, she's a total shut-in due to a crippling case of imposter syndrome. Despite being passionate about her work as an artist and having the skill to match, there's the feeling anyone only gives her time of day because of her wheelchair. Not out of genuine support, but an arbitrary sense of pity. And so she closes herself out of the world to this perceived coddling, turning even the closest of friends and family away, and is quite cold to Inko upon first meeting him. However, thanks to a bit of prodding from the charismatic and ever-flamboyant Mr. Yatican, her curiosity and Inko is peaked, setting the stage for a blossoming friendship. And who knows, the two might learn a few things about themselves along the way. Olivia's story is one where she is pushed out of her own little world to embrace the real one, learning to grow past that mistake of having pushed everyone who genuinely cares about her away. She's a very well-executed character, delivering a heartwarming and to some relatable story to the player as they witness her growth as a person. Dinosaur, whatever. It's all rounded out by a diverse cast of side characters. Inko meets the aforementioned Mr. Yadikan, a relatively young but wise art teacher who pushes his students to be the best they can be both in and out of the confines of art. He also befriends Damien, a cheery, friendly if not dim fellow, Liz, a smart gal who seems to have things all figured out, and Ben, the popular kid beloved by all in his school. But Inko draws the ire of his girlfriend Mia, an aggressive, manipulative bully who serves somewhat as the game's antagonist, showing up to make things difficult. It's worth noting that much of the side characters in Wani feel rather passive, for lack of a better word. They're enjoyable, likable, and put a a little more fun and life into the experience, but they're ultimately not ones you get very invested in. Compared to its predecessor, where those characters really had their own things going on, they actually did things that felt like they had considerable impact, the supporting cast and Wani don't feel very substantial. This makes a story where a lot of the attention is consolidated on the main duo, which is fine, that's clearly the intent, though there's nothing wrong with that, but it's worth noting seeing as how it is a bit of a deviation from that which preceded it. And as long as we're talking about the side characters, Mia, the game's bully, kind of antagonist, did feel a little cheesy. I don't know, she's just kind of cartoonishly evil. Just really anime villain-esque. These secrets and backroom dealings she involves the player in is a little much, and it's kind of hard to enjoy her character. There are, of course, choices to be made throughout the experience, which ultimately direct the course of the story. While the choices initially seem small and inconsequential, they play a role in giving both Inko and Olivia the opportunity to grow as people. It was pretty interesting to replay the game and see the subtle little changes that came of each of them, and kind of reflect on why they have the impact they do. It makes for an experience that you want to play through again, see what the other choices lead to both in the short and long term. The humor is pretty good. It's genuinely funny and gives the game some charm. There were definitely a few lines and moments that managed to catch us off guard, resulting in more than a few chuckles and snorts. Not a lot of media manages to do that for us, so it's always a pleasant surprise when it lands. And of course here, there's a lot less references to real life memes and image board slash internet culture, which Snoot Game was certainly filled to the brim with. Such humor often comes across as somewhat intrusive and forced, so uh, certainly a step up in that regard. Heck, even the few times image board culture was referenced, because it, it is, it was done so in a way that felt like it fit within the confines of the story and world. Speaking of the world, we also liked that there were glimpses into this strange new city where humans and sentient dinosaurs just live together. You get to experience snippets of culture, history, the accommodations that have to be made for the more unique species. It's such a tiny aspect, but we love little things like that. It makes the world feel a little more real. So yeah, the experience we had in the story was pretty 
good. Olivia is an easy character to get invested in and attached to. The writing feels professional, despite slightly repetitive dialogue, but with all the but yes and but yes and but yes that are throughout. A bit slow at points, but it usually feels like there's something going on, and it remains engaging throughout its runtime. Which, depending on how fast you read and take things in, can be anywhere around 9 hours, so you can certainly be expected to get your money's worth. The music's good, it's serviceable, it definitely helps you get into the scene playing, it immerses you into the happenings, but other than that, it doesn't really stand out to us. It's not a particularly memorable soundtrack, and it's certainly nothing we'd listen to outside of the confines of the game. It's well made, it does what it needs to, and that's that. I will say there were probably one or two tracks we didn't really like. One of them is this, I don't know if it's rock or metal or whatever it is, it's just really obnoxious. Oh my god! We're gonna die! No! No, please! Please! No! No! Please! No! But then again, we did like that one song that goes like... It's good. It, it's vibrant, expressive, and can be quite beautiful. If there's anything bad we'd say about the art itself, it's that we wish there was more of it. While art is a difficult and time-consuming process, there are a lot of scenes that could have been better hammered in had they been drawn from the ground up. We certainly wouldn't have minded seeing a bit more of the side characters depicted outside of the restrictions of their character stills. It's just a bit of a missed opportunity. The backgrounds are drawn well, that is to say the backgrounds that are actually drawn, because some, or should I say most, are just photographs with their quality lowered, which is acceptable, but it does kind of take away from the immersion. As far as the character stills go, they all look good, but while some of them have a variety of poses to work with, for others you definitely notice how limited the range of motion is. Arms just stuck folded like they're in a freaking straitjacket or something. But you really have to give credit to the character designs, because they're really fun. You have Damien with these frills on his neck that flop about depending on his mood. Liz with her seemingly endless neck that just moves all across the screen. Mia what with all those spikes making her look quite imposing. A lot of them are very obviously references to other media. So you have Miss Prockling and Coach Solly, history and gym teacher based off of TF2 characters. Although Coach Solly brings to mind that one fitness influencer, Sam Shan Shah. You know, one of the characters, you get to meet their family, and the father gives off some real Hank Kill vibes. And what we liked about these parody designs is that they're obviously referencing something, you can tell what they're based off of, and it's amusing. But it's also not too on the nose to the point where it feels intrusive. They still feel like they're their own design. We would be remiss if we didn't talk about the animations, because yeah, Wani has them, and it's not just those visual flares you see with the character stills, which are still appreciated, but no, there are actual frame-by-frame -frame animations sprinkled throughout the runtime. They're short and few and far in between, but when they do pop up, they're pretty good. I mean, there is very clearly an understanding of the skill here. By all means, Wani definitely could have gotten by without any of them, so it's really cool that they're here. It's a nice way to emphasize certain moments in the game, and overall, it's a pretty nice touch. Mwah. If there's anything that I want to hug that gator hits the bullseye on, it's the endings. Depending on the choices you've made throughout the story, you can get one of four. There's enough buildup to really make you feel the impact of each one to the point where, I mean, we had physical reactions. Jaws dropping, mouths covered, smiles being had. It's good stuff. We'll kind of give a condensed interpretation of the endings here, so if you haven't played Wani and are on the fence of getting it, you can just skip to our final thoughts here. So like Snoot Game, Wani relies on a hidden point mechanic with Inko and Olivia of being given a score. Throughout the game, players are given choices, and while some of them may seem inconsequential, they determine whether or not a point is scored for either of them. The final tally ultimately coming to a head in the ending. Wani's turning point more or less happens when Mr. Yadakan, a teacher who was extremely influential for both Olivia and Inko, passes away, and she's been asked to give a speech in his memory at an upcoming winter formal. The decisions you've made up to that point determine how well she copes with that loss and how everything will ultimately end. Ending 1 is of course the worst ending, the choices Inko's made inadvertently preventing both him and Olivia 
from becoming better people, leading to Olivia unable to cope with Yadakan's death, becoming closed off and hostile, eventually lashing out at her foster family at the night of the formal, while Inko remains his oblivious and aloof self. In the scene where Inko rapid fires a bunch of pictures at Olivia, giving her speech at her absolute lowest, believing it to be a beautiful moment instead of a literal emotional breakdown was shocking indeed. When he later attempts to alleviate it by literally trying to hug it out, the accompanying art does a great job of portraying Inko's desperation to Olivia's disbelief and revulsion. And the animation just really seals the deal. <laughs> The silence to a mounting, dreadful ambiance. You know what happened. You don't want to believe it, but you know what happened. And the final scene where Inko leaves the hospital and half-heartedly tries to recover Olivia's pet rat outside, eventually abandoning it to the elements and moving on, is truly symbolic of the person he's become. We also found it interesting that this was an ending that saw Mia get a little more prominence, giving just a little bit of perspective to a character that the other endings don't really have. In ending 2, things go a bit better with Olivia seemingly taking Yadikan's passing well, However, it becomes clear that Inko's support and encouragement is getting to her head, giving her delusions of grandeur. This time, when she gives her speech at the formal, she makes the passing about herself, declaring herself as Yadikan's successor and inadvertently deriding her peers as ignorant fools whereupon his teachings were ultimately wasted. It's physically cringeworthy. The two have an argument over it, ending up in them going separate ways for a while, but they eventually reconnect, which at first is a pretty sweet moment. Perhaps they can move past this embarrassing moment and still find happiness in their life. Fast forward and the two now live together in a small apartment, with Inko getting an office job to support Olivia's pursuits in art. However, a promising job in an art gallery turns into little more than a slightly above minimum wage grind. And due to her unwillingness to compromise on her morals, she turns down opportunities that would see her moderately successful, ultimately dooming her to mediocrity. It ends with the two getting into more arguments, leading to a vase being broken. Those last few slides of the broken boss really cut deep and really encapsulates the whole scene. The ending is overall a good reflection that you've chose decisions that gas Olivia up too much, meanwhile Inko hasn't really grown enough to prevent the ensuing mess and properly handle it. In the third ending, Olivia is noticeably affected by the passing, but is still communicative and reciprocal. Not quite ready to accept Yadikan's passing, she initially decides to skip the formal. Instead, she and Inko wander around the city for a bit before stumbling upon a restaurant where a family troupe is performing. After witnessing a powerful performance as a transition of leadership occurs and a new head of family is selected, Olivia gets the dash of inspiration she needs to give her speech. And so the two race towards the convention center to where the formal is being held before it closes. It's a very tense scene, one where you're totally just mashing the next key because you're so invested in what's going on. You're smashing that thing as if it'll help them get there faster. But then you arrive only to find that ultimately you were too late. The thing's over and everyone's gone home. She will never give that speech which was so important to her. So in a snap that feeling of suspense and tension is replaced with regret and disappointment. About a year later, she's unable to graduate and so becomes a niche art streamer while Inko goes to college. After paying a visit to their formal high school, they visit Yadikan's grave, and Olivia, finally, in a way, gets to deliver her tribute to the man that meant so much to her. And though it may be too little too late, at least she finally gets to do it and put all of it behind her. And the art that reflects that, what with the sun shining through to imply a better future, is certainly moving. Ending 4 is the one where everything just goes right. Inko wises up and Olivia takes the passing well. When the dance comes up, there's an animation that plays where Olivia gets up out of her chair and uses her tail as something of a leg to dance on. It's a very well done animation, and after getting through that roller coaster of a story, it feels very rewarding. Like, you did it. After that, there's this whole, uh, I don't know, twist where we find out that not only is Ben on antipsychotics, but his girlfriend Mia keeps them from him in order to manipulate him into doing stuff. We find out that the relationship is kind of one-sided. It's a good way to introduce some interesting discord because up until this point, everything's gone off without a hitch. So, okay, here's something interesting to shake things up. Uh, that being said, it, it, it kind of flew over our heads. Uh, we kind of get it. Okay, popular kid that everyone likes has a debilitating mental illness and he 
compensates for it by seeking out acceptance from everyone else. You no, know, Inko says something like, oh, Ben and I are alike in that kind of way. You know, he, he's grown enough to reflect on himself. I don't know, it's just not as hard hitting as it could be because Ben isn't a very investing character. You no, know, he pops up in the story every so often, but he's not really developed all that much. You don't really feel like the friendship with him is, is very substantial. And the reveal ultimately has no lasting impact. Nothing comes of it because by that point, the game's pretty much over. So uh, it's a very meh event. But anyways, after that, everything goes off without a hitch. The gang goes off on vacation. There's a neat little drawing section in a nice little reference to the beginning of the game and the game signing off with the character shouting I want to hug that gator what well, was a nice note to end things off on and of course that secret ending where you see Inko propose to Olivia was it was very wholesome I mean what else is there to really say it's the ending where everything goes right it's a really fulfilling and satisfying note for the game to end off on after everything that's happened seeing everyone get their happy ending is pretty freaking sweet. Overall, hugging that gator was a pretty nice experience. It's a well-written, engaging, and moving story that was pretty fun to get through. I'm gonna give I Wanna Hug That Gator an 8.5 out of 10. As far as recommendations go, if you're the type of person who enjoys visual novels and doesn't mind having to beat the furry slash scaly allegations, honestly, there's no reason not to get it. At $15, it's a pretty fair price. So if it looks good to you, well, hell, give it a buy. I'd say you're in for a damn good time. That's gonna do it for this review of I Wanna hug that gator. Now, if you're new here, welcome. If you're not, welcome back. You've just watched a video from the Jetavision. If you like the content and want to keep up with our game and movie reviews, subscribe to the channel, follow Twitter, and join the Discord. Mac, cheese the Jetavision, and you can consider that gator hugged. At a time when I can send a fax from an airplane, electric utilities still believe in guys jumping over backyard fences to read a meter. Why?